My name's Josh Livney. This is Mapping in 3D, Tips and Tricks for the Google Earth API KML. I'm co-presenting with Mano Marks. And I'm just going to go ahead and get started, because we're a couple minutes late, talk about a really, really easy agenda today. I'm going to be talking about the Earth API, hand it over to Mano. He's going to give some good, uh, exciting news on KML. Time for Q&A at the end. So as with all the other sessions, we have a wave. I've gone ahead and put that wave URL at the bottom left of most of the slides, so no worries if you didn't get it in time. It's still down there for you to hop on, and we'll go to those questions at the end and discuss amongst yourselves. So Earth API. First of all, a little bit of jargon and nomenclature. When I say the Earth API, what I'm referring to is the Google Earth plugin that goes into your browser, and it's associated JavaScript API. If I say the Google Earth client or uh, downloadable client, I'm referring to the full-fledged application that people might be uh, downloading and installing on their computers. It's kind of got that left nav bar, turn layers on and off. But today, we'll just be using that kind of as a reference. The focus of the discussion is the Earth API. And I just want to talk about a few things that have happened since last year. Last year, uh, my colleague Roman gave a really uh, exciting talk on the Earth API, lots of new features. And since then, the team's been hard at work at lots of stuff, including kind of first and foremost making sure that this plugin is ubiquitous, that it's everywhere, and that lots of people are using it. So as was mentioned yesterday, we have over 100 million installs of the plugin, which is significant, in my opinion. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, first of all, you guys have built great apps. People go to your websites, they install the plugin, and that's awesome. On our end, we've done a couple of things. We are bundling the API with the downloadable client. So folks download Google Earth, they install the application. If they have a compatible operating system and browser combination, and on that note, we are compatible with IE7 and 8 and Chrome in Mac and uh, lots of browser support, then they'll automatically get that plugin installed. And um, now they uh, don't have to sort of see that please install the plugin screen when they go to your website. In addition, you may have noticed um, about a month ago or so, maps.google.com, I'm just going to show this really, really fast, uh, has this Earth View link at the top right. Apologize for these extra uh, buttons I have here. And it'll pop right into a 3D version of Earth um, using the API, the same API. This is the kind of application that you guys can build. And I think that says a lot of things. First of all, it shows our commitment to this product, and we're putting it on one of our core pages, maps.google.com. It shows the kind of stuff that you can do um, with the API, integrating in your site, you know, all the search functionality, everything shows up just as you would expect with a regular 2D Maps application that people are used to. And it also shows that, hey, we've got a lot of people go to this website. They're seeing the plugin. They're familiar now with the controls, all of those folks, and they already have it installed. Again, so lots of folks have it installed. Also in the last year, um, we have a kind of a more stable release. It was stable before, but it, it's a bit more robust now and really nice, solid plugin and fast. Got a faster load time, and um, generally we, we keep working on those things, of course, all the time. But those are some significant changes since last year. Um, that's not why you're here, though. You hear about the new features. So that's what I'm going to be talking about the next little bit. And the first kind of big feature is a developer channel. This is obviously aimed at you guys. And the hope here is that we can give you kind of an advanced look uh, at a pre-release version before we put it out to the public so that you can get an idea, one, of all of the upcoming features, start coding some cool applications that take advantage of them so when the uh, big launch does happen and everyone has the updated version, your site's ready to go with cool new stuff. And also so you can test your sites for backwards compatibility, make sure we didn't accidentally miss something in our testing, some little quirk, and also give us feedback what you think of what we're up to here with our new version, and, and just sort of discuss amongst yourselves what we've added so that we have a, a good uh, kind of a back and forth with you guys. To that end, you'll notice if you go to this link, which is live right now and has some documentation on the upcoming features that I'll be going into, there is a link to a forum, and you can go to that forum. It's just to Google Groups, and uh, that's for you guys to discuss this kind of pre-release version. So right now on that channel, you'll notice the download link isn't up yet. We're hoping to put that up really, really soon. Um, the plugin that I'll be uh, demoing today is, is really the same um, functionality as the one you'll be downloading um, shortly. So it's ready to go, it just hasn't quite been pushed out yet. Um, next is this kind of uh, sandbox that I've put together. It's very similar to the um, 
code playground that has a, a lot of our APIs on it, but it's just customized specifically for examples of the latest functionality in Earth to give you some uh, just simple context of how to, how to put these features in use. And I'll be kind of keeping that up to date as we put out new pre-releases, so you've got a place to go that's more than just a, a kind of a basic reference that hasn't been fully integrated into the docs and see how to uh, take advantage of the new stuff. So with that in mind, the first uh, kind of exciting um, new addition is programmatic access to time, which is an often requested feature and just a really cool one. It lets you do a lot of stuff that was impossible before. So as you guys know, um, in the, the plugin, you can do everything you can with, with the full Google Earth, a, a couple of edge cases, including load up uh, time KML, get your time slider, play tours that have time. But once that happened, there's really not much more you could do from there programmatically. So we're now allowing access to the time primitive uh, using JavaScript API. I have some simple code up here. You get the idea. Basically, um, the time primitives work on any uh, feature, such as your place marks, abstract view, your cameras or lookats, and also this um, time container object, ge.getTime, you'll notice down near the bottom. And there's a container object for all of our uh, time-related uh, functions where GE is your Earth instance that you've initialized, and um, we'll, be, we'll be going into that in more detail. So in this simple case, I create a time stamp. The time stamp is a get when. If it was a time span, it would have a get begin and a get end. I set it to a string. I'll talk more about the string format in a second. And I can set that on you know, a place mark or a look at, or again, the Earth instance itself, and, and set the time right there. So already you have a ton of functionality that you uh, just didn't have access to before in terms of setting the virtual time of your Earth instance to whenever you want, so that if you've loaded up a GPX track or something like that, um, or some KML with time, and you want to move to a certain location, you can do that programmatically. So one just a short note on the string that I mentioned. We use uh, the XML standard for um, uh, time notation, and that's not quite the same as the JavaScript date object. And so we have this little uh, quick helper function uh, get system time, which will return a time stamp of the, the system time. So, for example, if you're building an application and people are clicking and adding markers, you could associate each of those with the, the current time. So this is a quick little shortcut. And um, we may be adding some more sort of useful shortcuts down the line, depending on feedback in the forum. So the next piece I want to show with time, and I'll get into a demo in one second here, is just the fact that we can turn historical imagery on and off really, really powerful with some very simple syntax. Don't need to memorize it. I'll show it in the demo. And we have some control over the UI, which is an interesting concept that we didn't really have previously in the API in terms of making the UI come and go if you want to make your own controls. So let's take a look at some demo and actually see, uh, see what I'm talking about. So first of all, um, uh, this is the, the sandbox that I put together. You guys can play around with it right now. It's live. It'll be live after this talk. So if you're watching this later, you can hop in here and uh, check out all of this stuff. You'll notice in this, uh, and I'm not going to go through all the demos in here. They're just kind of to help you out using different pieces. We don't have time to go over all the new, all the new stuff that's added. But in this demo right here um, is all the stuff I talked about so far. So first of all, I add a few place marks. And let's take a look at the function that I used to add these place marks. So add place mark here. I pass it uh, a lat long. It's using the awesome extension library that Roman Eric put together. And this just lets us add a point in one line. So that saves all kinds of time. If you're not using the extension library, you're uh, typing more than you need to. So keep in mind, um, there's no time-related stuff in here. Use the extension library to, to get places faster with the API. But here's, um, here's the basic code that we looked at on that first uh, code slide. Create a timestamp, uh, set it to a certain time, which was the string we passed in, 1988, uh, 2012, the various strings I made, and then just set the time primitive for that place mark. And now what we have, because we've done that, is immediately that time slider will show up, and we have um, these place marks with just a specific uh, uh, timestamp. So if I move out of the excuse me, range of that timestamp, it'll go away. And all the functionality is there that you would expect. You can play through and so forth and, and expand it out. The other things that are on here, uh, a simple method to um, log the time. So if I go ahead and hit log time, I should get uh, 2012. If I set it to the uh, current system time, I should get a timestamp that's slightly uh, more convoluted. If I go ahead and set a time span here, um, I can log it and notice that it's uh, kind of got a start and an end. So that's the concept of stamps and, and spans for time. 
Also, we can enable time machines. So this is really cool. I'm going to go ahead and go to, say, 1988. Um, enable the time machine. The historical imagery pops up. And now we can really uh, have some power with telling amazing stories, uh, whether it's glaciers retreating or your reenactment of something over 10 years, and you want to get this historical imagery in place programmatically. Um, I think this is just really, really cool. So we can hop in here in San Francisco and see some old imagery uh, before the Loma Prieta earthquake, and then move ourselves to, say, um, 1995. And now we have a bunch of parking lots here. And if we move it to the current time, um, you can see them in more vivid detail, exciting parking lots. So you can really see the change in time. Uh, you know, we have tons of imagery. If you want to see Haiti the day before the earthquake, the day after, the day after that, it's really uh, a lot of fascinating things you can do here um, with these new features. And again, if you're not happy with this control here, we can go ahead and just make it go away. But we still have access to all of that functionality. You can build your own buttons. And so I think this is extremely powerful and robust um, access access to time. But of course, we're not quite done with time. The last piece is setting the rate that the virtual uh, sort of internal clock of your Earth instance uh, moves at. And this is important to think about differently from just playing and pausing, because we can set this rate uh, to be 1, which means for every second of real time that passes in our lives, one second passes in this Earth instance. Or we could set it to 60, and every second that passes in our real time, one minute will pass. And so this is, is really powerful in terms of being able to play through things at different rates. And I'll just go through some of these ideas here. So second line there, you can see we can play a year in one second. That might be nice. You have a 10-year story to tell. You want to play it in you know, uh, 10 seconds. We have um, the ability to interact with the UI a little bit. So what if, for example, someone you've loaded up a network link. It's got um, some arbitrary KML. You don't know all the time spans. You want to be able to do the same thing as if that person had hit play. We can get the calculated rate from the UI. And uh, I'll show you an example in a second. And we can also, if you want to get really fancy, get the beginning and end, get the, uh, basically a time span here, that UI extent, um, so, you, so you know what you're dealing with there. Um, and then finally, just a pretty simple API call there to, to set it. So let's take a look at that. Demo three. Same simple place marks that we had before. I can go ahead and set the rate to um, 600. It should move very, very slowly. You almost can't even see it. I'll just start adding some zeros to get it to speed up. And if you wanted to know how fast it would play, had I hit the play button, that's, that's a fast. And we can also check what rate it's playing at at any given time, which is really useful in case people are fiddling around with the UI in ways that you weren't expecting or, or maybe had done various interactions you weren't quite sure where they're at. So I think this, this basically gives us all the things that you could wish and hope and dream for. Maybe we missed some with time. So hopefully you guys uh, take good advantage of that and, and build some cool stuff. The next uh, topic I'm going to get into in detail is balloons. Um, the main difference, really, with balloons in the, the API versus the downloadable client is the client uh, ships with WebKit, and those balloons are rendered in WebKit, whereas the plugin renders the balloons using the browser that people are using. So it's just really important when you're creating your KML to think about cross-browser compatibility and how that's going to get rendered. But the other big difference um, is now we're running in the browser with the security uh, of the user in the browser. And there could be all kinds of stuff in this KML, JavaScript, um, other things that could have security implications. And so our, our solution there is we just strip out all of this stuff, which I'm going to call active content for this talk. So we strip out the active content, and that means your um, code doesn't work anymore. It's a little disappointing. So there's a, a few ways to work around this. And the common pattern is what we'll do is we'll listen for a click event. And if someone clicked on a place mark and the balloon would pop up, we'd say, hey, don't pop up that balloon. Actually, prevent the default is the, the syntax there. Instead, let's get the description um, of that place mark and create our own custom balloon, uh, HTML string balloon, HTML div balloon, and then pop that open. And because we've done it programmatically, we can put the JavaScript in that's enabled and working. And I'll, I'll show you a demo in a second. And that works. Great. So now we can have JavaScript in there. But there are some problems with this pattern. Um, the first problem is, what if you have extended data? 
uh, get description gets the actual description, and you can get the name to sort of get what would be by default the title of the balloon. But more and more folks are using um, templates and for other reasons using extended data, and that's uh, not going to work with this pattern. So you'll, you'll just get the description every time instead of the actual values and the nice rendered content that you would expect to um, show up the same way maybe in your plugin as, as you would in Earth. And so the solution that we have here is a, a couple of new methods. So um, one is get balloon HTML, and this will get the content um, of the placemark rendered with all of the extended data in its appropriate uh, styled template. Um, but the active content will still be stripped out, which is great. It's actually it's not a bad idea to not allow users to run arbitrary, potentially unsafe JavaScript and other things, um, and that, unless you're feeling really confident you know where that KML came from. On the other hand, you often are. It's your KML, it's your data, and uh, you might have a YouTube video you want to pop up and just play, and that, that would be great. And so we have get balloon HTML unsafe, which is a warning to you guys, just keep in mind. That stuff's not stripped out, and so it will um, get rendered uh, with all of the active content in there, and the YouTube videos will play, and the JavaScript will make things flash, and, and so forth. That's what people do with JavaScript, I think. So let's look at a demo of that. So balloons. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, look at this extended data example. What I'm doing is. Uh, parsing this, this KML string that I have. And what you'll notice in this KML is I have um, a style for the balloon. It's got a template in here. You can guess uh, maybe some kind of animal. We're expecting it to say species is something and age is something else. And when we hop down here to the uh, extended data of our placemark, here's our placemark, we have some extended data, you'll notice that we have a badger. And the badger's age um, it's actually got some JavaScript. We don't want to just display it, make people click to see the badger's age. Should alert three for us, though, right? So I think I, uh, I'm going to reload this since I cut and pasted there. We should have a place mark, and when we click it, we do not see the extended data. And the reason for that is down here, it's a tricky demo, I have get description. Let's go ahead and change this to get balloon HTML unsafe, and run that code. And what we should get is a place mark with our extended data rendered appropriately, and if we click to see the age, app spot says three. So had we chosen just get HTML, that alert, it would still render like this, it would look like this, but you click on it and nothing would happen. So that's just a really common thing folks run into. They click on some JavaScript, they have some other stuff, and then it just doesn't work. Why doesn't this YouTube video show up? And so this, this is a great solution for those kind of more robust placemarks. It, it was pretty much impossible before. You could get the KML and parse it yourself, but then the styles wouldn't apply. So this is, this is a huge step forward. Um, it doesn't actually solve everything, though. Sometimes you're popping open balloons and nobody clicked on them, so listening for a click event won't work. Uh, for example, there's a tour, and you're playing through the tour, and then you have some animation update, and the balloon pops open, and there's no way to do it. So new balloon opening event. Uh, this, I think, is going to be really useful for another almost impossible situation. You can just listen to this event, a similar pattern, except we're listening on GE instance here. And as soon as we hear a balloon opening, we can go ahead and um, do this basically same pattern as before, instead of listening for a place mark click. So it's really just a mix and match of these, which is best for your particular use case. Uh, you don't always just want to use this because uh, you might have some place marks. You don't want to override the default uh, thing that happens when a balloon pops open. Maybe you only want to do it on your particular content. Um, so keep in mind, you don't just want to go for this. You use whatever's best for your situation. And speaking of getting your own content versus some arbitrary KML, I don't have time to go into these, so I'm just mentioning them because uh, I know some folks have just been begging for this because, again, it makes life so much easier. We have a bunch of new methods. They're in the documentation. I'm not going to go into them uh, in detail here, except to say, if these look like things that you've been wanting, you're really excited right now. Um, I will just want to mention that we have some amazing, uh, amazing demos out there in the sandbox. We have some partners who've built great stuff that you know, aren't in the sandbox as well. Make sure you go out and check the stuff out there. If you were around last night, I'd, how many of you saw the Virtusphere demo at the party last night, the huge hamster ball? And that actually um, can run not only their game that they're playing their shoot 'em up, but uh, a shoot 'em up that uh, Vermont on the team, who 
uh, not only did a lot of these cool things that are out today, put together that uses um, arbitrary controls, in this case, Virtusphere, to have the Earth API uh, embedded in that. So as you're looking around the VR goggles uh, and the, the control or the gun, it actually interacts with the API. So that example, the sandbox examples, stuff you can see um, in our gallery, hopefully give you guys some, um, some good impetus to build some demos that we can get you in the sandbox next year and, and see what you do. So with that, I want to hand it over to Mano, who's going to talk about KML. OK. Look, no hands. <laughs> Wait, I'm not sure what that means. OK. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. My name is Mano Marks. Thanks, Josh, for the introduction and, and uh, the, the great new things. I'm really excited about what's going on with Earth, with Earth and KML. And I'm here now to talk to you specifically about, uh, about KML. I've got, in particular, I've got uh, one technique that I've kind of run into and, and seen an, a, a couple of people develop over the last year that I want to share with you. I'm going to share with that with you first because it's old KML. Um, and then I'm going to share a new, uh, a new feature of KML because I knew as soon as I start sharing the new feature with KML, you're going to want to try it out and you're going to you know, start playing with it and you're going to ignore the other piece. So that's, uh, that's, that's the reason for the ordering there. How many of you are KML developers? Nice, nice. I like seeing that. Uh, you know there are over half a billion KML files on the web right now. It's, well, it's the largest, uh, the most used geographic data uh, language out there. So I'm very, very happy to talk to you about some things. Um, one, uh, one thing I want to talk to you about, the, the, both of the things that I'm talking to you about today are really about efficiency. So um, KML provides you, it's an XML markup language, so it can be, it can be a little verbose compared to you know, some sort of very compact uh, JSON strings or something like that that, that people are passing around. But, um, but Google Earth has such tremendous capacity to be able to show you know, tens of thousands of vertices and points on, on things that people tend to, to load up their KML with lots of, lots of stuff, because they, they really want to show a lot. And one of the problems that you, uh, you run into is, uh, well, one of the problems is bandwidth. File sizes just get really large. Um, and so the first technique I want to talk to you about uh, involves using network links that incrementally update, that get you um, get you the data in chunks so that you have a better user experience. One, you're using less, uh, you're using less bandwidth, right? So the server has to serve less, so there's less load on the, on, uh, on the server. Uh, two, things show up earlier uh, for the user. This incre in incrementally uh, updating your KML shows, shows something to the user. If you're, if you're downloading a, you know, two meg or five meg file all at once, then somehow you know, the user has to sit there and know, oh, this isn't broken, it's just waiting for a download. So I'm gonna, uh, the technique is actually to use update. Now, of those KML developers out there, how many of you have used update in KML? Wow, okay, that, the, that is, um, not very many of you, but it's also uh, you're probably the you know top 20 k update users in uh, uh, in the world right now because there's there's very few people who actually use uh, use update for uh, for their camel. So update is a mechanism that was introduced uh, back in uh, I'm not sure if it was camel 2.0 it might have been 2.0 2.1 but the the objective is to allow for changes to camel that's already been downloaded using a network link. Um, so let me, uh, let me do a quick overview of what the, what the technique looks like. Now, one reason that uh, update isn't used very often is it's actually fairly complex. Now, uh, one of the themes um, that you heard uh, from Josh when he was talking about balloons is, is security. And one of the things that we, we wanted to do was to be very careful about allowing different sites to, or, or rather not allowing, different sites to update and change KML that's already loaded by somebody else. So uh, 
what we, had, we had to put in a mechanism that made that difficult to do. So the first thing you do to, to accomplish this is you, uh, you load a network link. All right, so the network link goes off to a server and downloads, uh, downloads some KML. The second thing you do is load a second network link. This is usually the point where people get a little stuck because that's, that, that requires that the develop, they think, that requires that the user then download yet another network link. The idea is that the, the first network link downloads some KML and then the second network link goes off and downloads a network link control, which is uh, what you see on the right. Well, the technique that you do to get around the uh, the user actually having to download a second one is you put the second network link in the first file that's downloaded. So the first network link downloads uh, downloads file that has within it the network link to the network link control. It goes off, gets the network link control, and in that network link control, what it does is it, it has an update element with a create element that creates a whole bunch of place marks or whatever it is that you're, you're downloading. The other thing it does is it iterates a cookie. So this cookie um, then gets attached to this network link control. It's the only place in Google Earth that you have a cookie that is persistent. So this cookie gets attached to this net network link and the network link um, control basically successively iterates the cookie. So you, this cookie doesn't actually have to be um, it doesn't have to be something that, the, uh, that personally identifies the user. You could use it that way. That's a lot more complicated, and if you want to figure out how to do it, I'm sure you can. It's just lots of additional steps. But basically, it's, it's a counter that tells how many times you've hit the server, and then the server just makes a decision then, um, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go back and, and get the second or the third or the fourth either KML file or batch of KML, however you want to you generate it. Um, so that's, uh, that's what this, this diagram is showing. And let me show you what this actually ends up looking like. Both uh, Josh and I basically have recently shifted to using, uh, using Macs. So if we're a little slow on the Mac, that's what you're, you're seeing here. Um, okay, so we've got a little server running uh, local host here. And you see here, it downloads, I, I've got it set to update every four, uh, four seconds. Basically what I did is I just wanted to up, uh, um, do something fairly simple to illustrate the, uh, the concept. But the first, uh, the first batch of data is a, um, it's uh, KML that puts a place mark um, every point of longitude at one latitude and um, just does that from uh, 0 to 180 longitude. So, um, so you see there. And then each successive, every four seconds, when it goes and hits the server again, it loads the next one, which just does the same thing but shifts it up by one, uh, by one point of latitude. So you can see here, um, the user, and you can speed this up. You don't have to do this in one second. You could do this in, uh, or four seconds. You could do this in one second. You could also load larger amounts than I'm showing you here. But the idea here is, is basically just to show you this, this sort of gradual uh, increase of data in the, in the client. So to the user, it, it, it appears to, to happen very fast, but gradually more data gets uh, gets in there, so the, the user can then start, the user then knows that something's going on and can start interacting with it while the network link is still going. And, there. okay. So that's the tip. So now we're gonna get back to time. How many of you have tried to animate a model in KML before? Okay. How, or uh, a point, you could use a geometry, use time, time animation, okay. So a um, few, uh, few years ago when we introduced time to KML, back, back when we owned KML, 
um, before we gave it away to the Open Geospatial Consortium. Uh, we, we did it in order to add a fourth dimension to data. And the idea was that people could display time-related things. A, a point changes, uh, moves, uh, move, say you have a, a path that you're describing. You could, you could show it only during the time periods in which it, uh, which it, was, uh, it was active. But people immediately latched onto it as a way to do model animation. So they, they put in time, whether or not it was related to actual time, they put in time that, uh, you know, they could, you could put in time codes of, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So basically, they wanted to use it for, for time animation. They wanted to uh, use it for large data sets. And the problem with time is that for every place mark, for every geometry, for everything you did, for every piece of time, you had to recreate that. You had to create a whole new one with a new timestamp or a new time span. Um, and let me show you what, what that might actually look like. So Frank Taylor was kind enough to give me a GPS, GPX track that he, uh, uh, of his trip. So Frank Taylor uh, runs the Google Earth blog, and he's now taking a trip around the world. He's sailing in a boat. Um, it's very cool. And I converted that GPX track to a KMZ using this, using this method. And you'll see there that there's a line, and it's got a, it's got a path, and, and, and this is what it, it, it will physically look like if I play it. Let me zoom out a little bit. Press play. I'm going to set the rate down to 100 so that you can actually see what's, what's going on. I did hit tab. Uh, Okay. So you'll see, first of all, you may notice that it's really slowing down my interface to move through it as, it's, uh, as, these, um, as this time is, is playing. Um, let, me, uh, let me tell you what this, show you what the code actually looks like. Um, This is what the, the, the KML for this actually looks like. Uh, place mark with a timestamp. You might put in a multi-geometry or, or a single geometry. You could uh, get away with putting the timestamp maybe on a folder that's got a whole set of geometries. But regardless, you're, you're creating many, many place marks. And not only that, you ha um, for something like this, you're going to have to create many, many styles because uh, the point at the end of this, if I can find it here, um, is, is actually an arrow. And that arrow changes directions. And so every place mark that, that changes the direction of the line has to then have a separate style with a separately configured direction on it. And, uh, and it gets to be kind of a mess. And you see how this is actually moving I, I don't know if you can tell, but it's moving very slowly as I, as I sort of pan through it. That's because this file is, has 24,000 points along the GPX track. And it, cr and it created a file that was 21 megabytes in size. So you think there, there must be a solution to that. And people often said to us, well, why don't you, instead of creating a new point for every point in time, you allow us to move the point. So we did. So we're going to announce today a new extension to, uh, to KML, which is track. Now track is a way of, of, of moving a single point through space. 
And that point can actually be a point or it could be a model. So you can use this for both animating a, a specific point or you can use it for animating um, a 3D model along, along a particular route. Now there are the basic, uh, track is a geometry, so it lives inside of a place mark. And one of the reasons that this is, this is important is that you'll notice before we were creating a place mark for every single, um, for every single new timestamp. For, to, you know, we'd have to repeat that. Well, place mark is one within your own KML code, it's heavyweight. It takes, you know, there's a lot of code to, to create a place mark. The, um, two, it's, it's actually fairly heavyweight within, the, within Google Earth itself. It, you know, there's a lot that's associated with the object code for that. So track is a, is a geometry, which is a much slimmer, much smaller uh, thing within our own application. And for your KML, it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot slimmer as well. So this, this uses a technique of parallel arrays. So you see here, I just took a, a very small sample, obviously, of the 24,000 points along the way. There are three when elements and there are three GX chord, the GX uh, prefix identifying it as being in our extension namespace. These are parallel arrays. So the first when element corresponds to the first chord element, the second to the second, the third to the third. Still, uh, still a lot of writing for the individual, uh, the individual points, but the file, the same file that produced the 21 megabyte file uh, when using traditional methods, one, uh, uh, sorry, two megabytes, 2.2 megabytes, and uh, drop that down to a KMZ, so compressed version, 640 megabytes, including the 3D model inside of it. Uh, sorry, kilobytes. <laughs> For you on YouTube, let me repeat that. 640 kilobytes, including the model and the textures that were used on the model. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to zoom in. What I did was I took a model that uh, that Frank had done for his um, for his boat. And I'm getting a little slow down on my. Yep. So you see here that the model is moving along there, and it's moving along there, and it's got a point, uh, a point associated with it as well. And and it continues to move in, and I'm going to zoom in along that track. This is actually uh, made up of uh, of four different tracks, but the effect is essentially the same. And I didn't do any, uh, any optimization on this. I didn't you know, reduce the file size by getting rid of all the spaces or anything like that. Um, take an, uh, another look at, you see how the model is actually changing its orientation. I did nothing to accomplish that. I did not add in a single line of KML to do that. I could have, I, actually in track we also support them. Um, GX angles, which is a separate parallel array that gives you the different angles that, that the model would be facing at. But no, nothing to accomplish it. It automatically detects where, you know, where the next point is and reorients the model accordingly. So that's a, that's a, pretty, tremendous, a pretty tremendous benefit. So, 
I'm, I'm really excited to see this. Uh, as I said, I think both these, uh, both these techniques that I've demonstrated today are gonna really help you in creating much more efficient KML and also creating really interesting animations using, uh, using track. And the one last, uh, the one last point that I uh, want to make at this point is that we're uh, in the in the conversion from a GPX. We're also going to be putting in a mechanism for you to retain the metadata that might be coming along with your uh, with that uh, with that track. So in that G in uh, some GPX files, you have things like heart rates if it's a heart rate monitor, or you might have on your mobile device things like. Uh, the position of the phone itself, what, you know, what your orientation is, that sort of thing, which could then be used uh, very easily within our, uh, within track to reposition a model of yourself or something like that. Okay, so that, that concludes sort of the technical portion of the presentation. I wanna give a little shout out to, uh, for uh, Google Developer Qualification. Uh, those of you who've been to other Geo Talks uh, know that uh, we started a uh, Google Developer Qualification Program, which includes all of the, uh, the APIs you see there, and we're announcing uh, right now the inclusion of KML. So those of you who want to become uh, qualified developers, which would uh, basically means that we recognize that you pass a test and you contribute to community and you sort of keep your skills up, then you get listed in the Qualified Developer Program and that, uh, that gives, you, uh, gives other people access to you. I mean, what basically what happened was, for years people have been saying to us, hey, do you know a great KML developer? And we'd just all be like, well, off the top of my head, um, Josh Livney or you know, <laughs> something, and then we'd hire them, and then we'd have one less person we could recommend you to, to get outside. So you could be those people, and now we can, we can point them to a site so we don't all have these separate spreadsheets and, and everything. And, and it's a more objective evaluation. So this is, a, this is a great program, so please get involved. Now, uh, Josh, you wanna come up on stage and we'll go ahead and... That. Oh yeah, let's do, do that. You have, do we have the wave already up? Got here? it here. You got it there? Okay. Let's uh, click it in. Oh, you probably need this to Probably. Um, while we're getting this up, do you guys want to head up to the mic with any questions you have? Yeah, hi. With the track that you just showed, it's not focusing on on the point. It's not following it. Is there would would it do it automatically, or would you have to add like a code for focus or follow or? something like this, and um, does track work in Google Earth, KML? Uh, not, so not that's, a, that's a good point. Um, so everything that you've seen right now will not work in the current, except for the update tip that I gave you, will not work in the current release version of either Earth or the plugin. Uh, they, it will work in the developer channel release, and, both, uh, and they are targeted to work in both the release versions of Earth and the plugin when they're, they're finalized. Um, it, feedback like that, that's great uh, feedback. We haven't, uh, we haven't finalized how user interface is gonna work, so contribute that to the developer channel and we really, uh, we'll be really interested in to hear about that. Okay. So uh, two quick questions. Um, uh, you might have already sent it, but uh, what was the, what's the reduction in memory or, or how do you quantify this performance increase when you're doing track versus trying to use points to do animation? How do I quantify it? I, I did the conversion and, and tested it. I mean, <laughs> what, what was it? Uh, so it, same, same track produced a, a two megabyte track file and a 21 megabyte um, traditional placemark uh, animation file. Gotcha. And the larger the file and the more points, the more likely it is that that's gonna be a larger and larger file. Okay. Because uh, the more twists and turns you have, the more styles that you need, Etc. So that's gonna. Yeah. 
the second question is, um, we're actually using uh, Google Earth on a, on a production implementation now, and, and we have uh, two viewport windows. So we, we show one sort of 3D view and, a, and another top-down view. Yes. Um, we have a lot of problems with uh, in, in the launching of those two Google Earth instances. It actually starts up two processes on the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, is there sort of a best practice to stagger the launch, or is that a known bug, or, or are you aware of that kind of an issue? Josh, do you want to um, is this regarding the, the API and loading up two in the browser at the same time? Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have a, a best practice, but I have found that if you maybe just do a, a set timeout of like 200 milliseconds or something like that, the, the way that the, the API uses memories, we don't share the, cached, uh, the cache, the memory cache there. And so they kind of initialize a chunk of space for each. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I haven't really tested, tested that, but I have found it, if you just set like a, a small set timeout, a quarter of a second or something, that, that can stop some of that jerkiness that might pop up. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me go to the way for some questions. The most popular question here is, how do you keep the plugin from leaking too much memory when setting custom HTML balloons? When you create an event listener, it is quite difficult to remove the event listener and it sits in memory of the plugin. Good question. So that seems like two separate questions. You don't need to set an event listener um, when you create the when you create a, a custom HTML balloon. You can you can create those, and when you close them, those should be released to memory. As far as I know, I, I've definitely um, set up a couple things which had many thousands of uh, maybe custom balloons open and closed, and I, I didn't notice an increase in memory. But I haven't really looked at that. As for the event listener, yeah, I don't think we have a good way to remove event listeners, so that's a really great uh, request to the public issue tracker. We'll bring it up in the forum, and you know, when we get that kind of feedback, oh, we do. We have a remove event listener, I hear. I take it back. We do have one, and I'm unfamiliar with it. That's probably in the, the reference, the API <laughs> reference. So I'm glad that the experts, and that's a good point, the experts and the team are here to correct me. Um, yeah, so you should use the, uh, the remove event listener and, and get that out of your memory there. OK, so then the next question, um, is this available on mobile devices and browsers? Uh, the answer is, at, at this point, not, uh, not yet. It's something that we're evaluating. It's, uh, you know, um, every, uh, every additional uh, implementation makes it, uh, a, you know, more engineering work on our, our part. So we're, we are looking at that, and we're aware there's this actually quite a bit of interest in doing that. Um, so then the next question is, is there a Linux version of the plugin? The um, there's not a Linux version of the plugin, as, as the popular discussion on the issue tracker right now um, is well aware. But I am happy to say we have the intention of, of building uh, some Linux compatibility in the future. We just don't have a timeline to announce right now on that. Um, but we definitely pay attention to your guys' feedback, and we know that's a popular request. Uh, some questions up here. Yeah, if I construct multiple parallel arrays, would I be able to have multiple tracks running at the same time? Uh, you mean within the, um, yeah, so we, we actually, there's one element I didn't show which is called a multi-track. So you can, uh, you can create a multi-track which is a container for tracks. And so you can certainly have multiple ones. You can also have different um, place marks which have different tracks in them, however you want to separate that out. Um, and they can have timelines that overlap, and they will play uh, successfully. That was actually one of the design goals, was to allow you to, to have that kind of implementation where multiple tracks were playing at the same time. Imagine a boat race instead of a single boat, for instance. Thanks. Sure. Yes? Um, have you thought about an HTML5 WebGL version of the plugin? Uh, we're always looking at, uh, at new technologies that when we set out to do the, uh, the plugin originally. We didn't, uh, HTML5 was nowhere near what we needed. And uh, so we're always, uh, we're always evaluating where we're going to go with that in the future. The truth was we were able to repurpose a lot of the, uh, the Google Earth code directly. So yeah, I mean, it, it's something that we're, we're looking at. And uh, the product manager for Google Earth is sitting in the audience right here, Peter Birch. He's very tall. Uh, so you can, you can single him out. And, uh, and ask him about that. Thank you. Hi. Uh, is there any way to unload the Google Earth plugin like you have G-Unload uh, for Google Maps API? Uh, 
and un and unload events so that yeah. when someone say moves to a, another page, uh, it it uh, releases uh, its whole right, memory because stack. Because sometimes when I close the browser, the GE plugin is still you know running in the background. So. So not that I'm aware of. I may get corrected again in the moment. I do not believe that we have an unload. Um, yeah. I, I, if you do close that, that window, it will clean itself up. Um, or if the instance goes away, I think it uh, sounds like it might hang around for five seconds or something. 30, 30 seconds. I so mean, yeah, we have, uh, we have that. A um, few times I have like 10 instances of gplugin.dx in my task manager. So. That's why you know, I was looking for I'm sorry, it. Sorry, I can't uh, understand. Yeah, I, I missed that. You said you have a lot of different Earth plugin instances? Yeah. It's like I, I keep you know, running the Google Earth instances in different, I mean, different instances of the browser. And then I close them, and then you know, suddenly uh, it doesn't load. It doesn't free up the memory right away. So yeah, it sounds like there's about a 30-second a delay. Um, if you have lots of different instances, it's good to note, I, I believe the way that the memory works is they get successively less memory for each one. So just keep that in mind if you're going to be loading up 10, not to expect your 10th one to have the same cache available to it as the first one. Um, but yeah, uh, it sounds like th there's a bit of a delay there to, to keep in mind. Actually, I believe, don't they share this, the caches? No? No, sorry. They get the same size? Oh, smaller disk cache for tiles and, and so forth. That's a good point. Yeah. Nonetheless, uh, I mean, it, it is a good point. We don't have an API method to say unload. Um, and, and so it just kind of automates itself after. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yes. Um, will the JavaScript API get an update um, with tracks in it in the next plugin release? Or is that just a KML feature? Uh, so we we don't have a timeline for when it will get into the uh, into the API itself. We do intend to allow you to do anything that you can do in KML in the uh, in the API as well. So I, I can't tell you when it it'll happen, but that's uh, that's definitely on the road. Uh, there seems to be uh, some interest of using street maps on Google Earth plugin. Have you all thought about um, providing that kind of data instead of the terrain? Street maps, so like uh, using our map tiles from maps.google.com? Yes. Yeah, this, uh, this is something that um, periodically people do request of us. There are some, there's not a lot of actual technical problems from, uh, from our end, although it is a, they are different sources of, of data. There are some licensing issues that, that make it less than, uh, less than ideal for us to go and do it. And it hasn't been requested enough that we, um, we uh, have felt compelled to move towards it. Uh, it's actually, um, so uh, if you put it into the issue tracker and lots of people start it, then it, it is something we might take a little bit more interest in. We do, of course, have a roads layer in the, uh, in the API, so you can, you can see the actual roads overlaid on top of the satellite imagery. This is more of a comment um, than it is a question. On, uh, I work for a public um, agency, uh, and we're behind three layers of firewalls. I'm having a very difficult time rolling out Google Earth as the, the standard product. Uh, well, the Google updater interferes. It, it, there, all the security things get thrown. So I went with the Google um, Earth API for the, for the browser, and then I found I can't render the KML because it's behind the firewall. So I have to obfuscate the KML, make like measle dot kinds of stuff, and then stuff that out on the internet so that I can view it through the uh, Google um, um, Earth K you know, API browser-based ways, because I can't view uh, KML on, a, uh, on an intranet so, site. So I'm like yeah. trapped in between um, you so know, a work around, kind of a purgatory. Um, for that, which we kind of showed here, is um, you do need to have a, 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 web si uh, a web server serving up your KML content. You can't load it off a local file, um, your local disk, again, for those security reasons we mentioned. But, but on the I other have, hand. If I have regular Google Earth um, um, application, right. I can 
Right. But I can't have my end users install yes. it because of other security So issues. we don't want, for example, if you load up a network link and it says, hey, let's go ahead and open up everything in C temp whatever on some user's machine. So, so we don't allow the browser to access the local exactly. files. But a workaround that, that we showed here is running just a, a really simple localhost server, you know, a trivial one that was just Python's HTTP simple server at that. There's, um, you know, many simple servers that you could maybe run internally just to serve up KMLs, and um, that would solve the problem of uh, internal serving of those. Okay. Hi. I was wondering if it's possible to update the map with something like a live stream of uh, KML input? Sure. Sure. Uh, which, uh, which map are you? Are you, you just want to put KML on your, um, are you talking about our base map, or are you talking about being able to display KML on your site? I'm talking about uh, a KML uh, stream that is continuously updating. Right, so if you use a network link, mm -hmm. uh, the network link can be constantly pinging your server. You could set it to times as short as, a, as once a second. In fact, the update mechanism that I showed you is, ah. is precisely that. Uh, it doesn't, it, it, I, we ran everything off of localhost here just because we, you know, conferences, you have to be really worried about uh, internet access. But uh, in general, you would, you would have your own server that serves it out. I just have a quick question. Uh, are you sure. guys going to do any other projections for the globe? I'm like sorry, what was the question? Projections, like map projections. Like are the polar regions, it all gets distorted, and you know, like an equal area, e equidistant projection. You know, there's a whole bunch of different map projections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're hoping that we would support um, arbitrary projections on the globe? Correct. Um, well, I mean, the, yes. the globe is a, is a globe. Yeah. I mean, the, it's a little different. The, from there is the, a good point in that yeah. the play curry projection that sort of default, what some people call WGS84 projection, although it's a datum, is um, uh, you have some warping near the poles. Um, and it is possible if you were, for example, a, a Google Earth Enterprise customer to build your own globe, and then you could set the, um, it would still have to be a, a, the, a similar projection, but, but not have the globe distorted, have somewhere else distorted. But somewhere's, somewhere's uh, going to bound off into infinity um, on the globe. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, just uh, I'm Peter, the product manager. Just a couple more details on that. I mean, p part of the issue is that all the native infrastructure is in Potcare projection, and so it's not something that is easy for us to, to change. We, you know, obviously the poll issue is an ongoing issue with that projection. Um, and you know we've looked at some different solutions. Hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to to do you know something that will address the poll issue. But we don't have any plans for kind of an arbitrary projection because a lot of our our data is natively stored in uh, in a fixed projection. Uh, so the last question that's on moderator here is: Is there an offline version of the GE plugin available for, to download? And the answer is, is um, no at this point. Right? Yeah, I mean, it does yeah. work offline. Um, you, you don't have to have it online. And, and again, if you're say, an enterprise customer with your own globe, then, then you don't have to connect to our servers. Right. But it's not going to um, do much offline if it can't get any um, of our data, unless, unless you're really only loading your own data set. Well, and also it needs to be online for the, uh, when you start. Um, you start the plugin. Yeah, the initial um, JavaScript, I think you could I'm not sure if it is against the terms of service to grab the, the JS loader and uh, put it locally. Probably. Probably. Is. Probably. Yeah. Um, um, that's true. Yeah, that's um, true. I'm not sure what the terms of service say. It's but I, I, I think this, this is probably more, uh, more, they're probably more interested in what's, um, it, is the person who's in the, who asked this in the audience, do you want to come? I'm going to guess that you're more interested in having uh, an offline version for installation purposes, right? Yeah, Is that right? Installation. So most of the times, you know, the the, um, the end users are behind the firewall and they cannot connect to, um, they cannot go to Google or I mean, right. and download. Yeah. The software. Yes, yeah, so an offline installer. We um, we don't have we, we don't, don't offer uh, a link to a sort of uh, here's the latest offline installer for you guys to put throughout your your organization. Right. Um, but that is that is a feature request that, that we have it, in mind. It's something that's frequently requested. And we're we're definitely looking the, at that to allow for enterprise installation. I was out on the forums griping about this very issue, and somehow or other, I found my way to a, the EXE for Google Earth 5.1. I forget what build, what version, and I downloaded that and I put it out on my uh, 
my um, uh, local shared drives uh, that you know like 5,000 people have um, access to and I told them to go get that. So. Yeah, I, I mean that is a good point which I mentioned earlier is we bundle the plugin and the API with the downloadable client. So if, if you have that um, installer locally, it, it would install the plugin. We don't have a separate um, plugin only uh, sort of yeah. option. Is there any way we get to choose like which version to download or which version to install? Because it right now it updates automatically whenever there are any updates. So, so that's kind of one of the, the the big advantages of the developer channel is it no longer has to come as a big surprise. Uh, wow, everything got updated and now I'm at a new version. By joining the developer channel, you'll get access to that kind of pre-release as long uh, as well as you know uh, our release notes that we'll post when we update that to the forum. And you'll know it's coming, uh, in general, a couple of weeks ahead of time before the public launch. So um, that, that hopefully will help solve some of that. Thanks. Uh, Peter has some qualifications gonna, on gonna that. <laughs> jump in again, a couple questions. Um, so one issue is we don't allow arbitrary download of any version. And part of that is because it's sort of like you can't go to a certain version of website. It's, you know, every time you go to the website, you get all new JavaScript, all new code. You know, this is a combination of a JavaScript API and a plugin necessary for it to work, and they work in harmony. So it's not always an option for us to say, oh, yeah, right. get five versions back and run it, because uh, it probably won't work anymore. There'll be other compatibility issues. So for enterprise customers, we do bundle a sort of offline package so that it can be run and is supported for a certain window of time. But in terms of open consumer, where people are pulling down, you know, going to a bunch of new websites, we want to be able to have a very robust, well tested single version that's updated that everybody's using so you don't have to worry about you know five or whatever different versions out there so so that's so, i think we're out of time we're yeah unfortunately off. but uh right. we'll be around up here to answer questions or maybe outside actually to answer right. questions so uh and also happens. i believe there uh, are geo api's uh, office hours going on upstairs mm, yeah. and probably one of us will be up there for that as well Good point so thank you very much for coming thanks guys